This is the Mathematics Education Podcast from MathEdPodcast.com. Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Chuck Munter. I'm an assistant professor of mathematics education at the University of Missouri. As listeners may know, my colleague, Dr. Sam Otten, recently produced the 100th episode of this podcast. To celebrate, we've decided to create a new kind of episode, one that is more of a digest of several recent research studies than an in-depth interview focused on just one study. Those interview episodes will still be happening, but periodically we will also include these digest episodes in the podcast feed. This new format is modeled in part after the old journal Investigations in Mathematics Education. Published quarterly from 1968 to 1988, that journal offered, quote, expanded abstracts and critical analyses of recent research, unquote. To help translate that idea into podcast form, we extended an invitation to all listeners to become contributors who submit brief summaries and interpretations of recent works that they are interested in. In this first Digest episode, we offer four such summaries. First, Sam will summarize an article from the November issue of Educational Researcher by David Blazer and Cynthia Pollard on the influence of test preparation. Second, Asal Oslamond will share a summary of a recent article in Journal of Statistics Education by Lawrence Lesser and colleagues. Third, Jeremy Strayer will discuss four chapters from AMTE's recent edited volume, Building Support for Scholarly Practices in Mathematics Methods. And finally, Marty Fong will share a summary of Nicole Louie's article in the latest issue of JRME on the Culture of Exclusion in Mathematics Education, which will be followed by a brief follow-up interview with the author. We hope you enjoy this first attempt at a Digest episode. We plan to do more in the coming year and welcome suggestions and contributions from listeners. I'm Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and I'm going to share a brief summary of Blazar and Pollard's study, Does Test Preparation Mean Low-Quality Instruction? It was published recently in Educational Researcher, Volume 46, Issue 8. This study is situated in the United States context of heavy pressure placed on high-stakes tests, um, and that pressure has been on the rise since the early 2000s. And Blazar and Pollard noticed an apparent contradiction and carried out their study to see if they could resolve that contradiction. The contradiction is that some people say that test preparation narrows the scope of what teachers cover and it crowds out ambitious teaching, especially because test items are usually fairly low in cognitive demand. However, other people say that test preparation increases the rigor of instruction because the tests are aligned to standards that are higher than what states had before. So which is it? To answer that question, the study focused on more than 300 fourth or fifth grade teachers in five different districts. These teachers did volunteer for the study, which might bias the sample a little bit, but their background characteristics and value-added scores were comparable to the total population of teachers in the districts, so they actually seem like a reasonable sample. The teachers completed a survey about their test preparation habits, and the researchers also looked at lesson observations for a subsample of the teachers, about 60 of the 328. The subsample included teachers for whom there were two different types of lesson observations, one that involved a test prep lesson and one that involved a non-test prep lesson. This way, the researchers could look not just at general trends related to test prep, but also at specific differences in instruction that might occur while teachers are leading test prep. The lesson observations were coded using the MQI instrument, specifically the dimension of ambitious mathematics instruction. This allowed Blazar and Pollard to see whether the ambition of the instruction, things like connecting ideas, building on student ideas, or including mathematical explanations, was related to the test prep. It's also important to note that there could be a relationship between the instruction and the particular features of the high-stakes assessment. They considered this possibility because two of the districts used an assessment with fairly high cognitive demand items, and the other three districts used an assessment with fairly low cognitive demand items. So what were their results? Did they find evidence that favored one side of the argument over the other? Well, yes, they did. The main finding was that there's an overall negative relationship between test preparation and ambitious math instruction. But importantly, it's not a very strong relationship. For a one standard deviation increase in a teacher's emphasis on test preparation, there was only a 0.1 standard deviation decrease in their ambitious instruction. 
This general finding was corroborated when they looked at individual teachers across lessons. For the same teachers, the test prep lesson tended to have a lower MQI score by about 0.25 standard deviations. The small size of this relationship means that people who say standardized testing is completely ruining instruction, those people are overblowing the issue. But it does seem to be true that an emphasis on standardized test prep slightly reduces ambitious instruction. It's just that many other factors are probably much more important with regard to instruction, such as teacher characteristics and preparation, curriculum, coaching, and so forth. Those things seem to probably be much more important than just the test prep. What about the folks who claimed that the rigor of tests would spur ambitious teaching? That claim did not seem to be supported by the study. In particular, the two districts that used the test with higher cognitive demand did not show a pattern of higher scores on the MQI. Altogether, the authors state that tests are probably not an effective lever for instructional change. Again, other factors likely have greater associations with ambitious instruction. Now, I say associations because this study could not fully make the case for a cause and effect, but I do give them credit for controlling for several potentially confounding variables. If they had just looked at the direct relationship between test prep, as reported on the survey, and the quality of instruction, as measured by the MQI, and if they had assumed that the focus on test prep determined the instructional quality scores, then it would be easy to poke holes in their findings. We could just say, well, those teachers who report more test prep are not random. It's plausible that teachers who naturally teach in an unambitious way are precisely the ones who maybe tend to give more time over to test prep. But the researchers avoided this pitfall by controlling for several important variables. They controlled for teacher resources, teacher background, and also school level and district level factors. And as mentioned before, they also examined a subsample of the teachers and actually viewed two lessons from the same teachers, one that was test prep and one that was not test prep. So this allowed them to check whether it was just certain teachers tending to do more test prep or whether it was actually teachers teaching differently when they do test prep. And it turned out to be a very good thing that they included these controls. Blazar and Pollard reported that if they hadn't controlled for teacher background and district factors in particular, then it would have appeared as though the negative relationship between test prep and instructional ambition, it would have appeared to be much stronger than it actually was. But with the controls in place, it turned out to just be that relatively small negative relationship that I summarized earlier. So that's a quick rundown of the study. I think it's a really helpful analysis given the importance of high stakes tests in our educational culture right now. And it's good to have some empirical data to rely on, even if it's not the strong indictment of tests that some people may have been hoping for. Overall, it's a reminder that we should be guided by the evidence rather than making up our minds separately from the data. And of course, we should also remain critical and never put too much weight onto a single study like this. But this article, in my view, is definitely worth considering, and I encourage you to download it from Educational Researcher, published by AERA. Hello, I'm Asal Aslamad from University of Toronto. The article that I will be discussing in this Digest episode is titled, Assessing Fun Items in Increasing Learning of College Introductory Statistics Students, Results of a Randomized Experiment. The authors of this article are Lawrence Lesser, Denise Pearl, and John Weber. Their article is published in the Journal of Statistics Education in 2016. Based on the review of literature, the authors were able to identify that various disciplines, for example, psychology, social studies, biology, economics, and mathematics have used fun items to demonstrate subject matter ideas to students. These included the use of songs, poems, cartoon, and magic, which indicated improvements in students' recall of contents and reduction in their anxiety toward learning the subject. The authors realized that there's very little research on assessing the use of fun items on students' statistical learning, their statistics attitudes, and their statistical anxiety. Therefore, they became interested to conduct a randomized experiment to assess the use of fun items on students' statistical learning, their statistical anxiety, and their attitude toward statistics. They selected fun items from the Digital Library of Consortium for the Advancement of Undergraduate Statistics Education, which is normally referred to as CAUSE, that use songs, 
cartoons, poems, quotes, or jokes to illustrate introductory statistical ideas to students. Two institutions in the United States were chosen for their study that had different and diverse student populations. One introductory statistic course from each institution participated in this study. These two statistics courses were similar in terms of the statistical contents that they covered in their courses. The authors conducted a quantitative study Uh, 51 students from the first setting participated in this study. 112 students from the second setting participated in their study. The participating students completed the survey of attitude towards statistics, which is referred to as SATS, that has uh, 36 items and which compromises uh, six uh, attitude components, and statistics anxiety measure, SAM, with uh, five uh, subscale measuring statistics anxiety. So they administered these two surveys to students twice in the semester, once at the beginning of their statistics course and another time near the end of their course. Data regarding the participating student statistics outcomes were also included in the analysis. In order to eliminate the instructor effect as a confounding variable, the selected fun items were incorporated in online course materials. So half the participating students from each section were randomly assigned to watch online videos that had fun items inserted in them, and the remaining half students were randomly assigned to watch regular online videos that had no fun items inserted in them. So there are two groups. One was the uh, experiments group, which were the students who were randomly assigned to watching videos that had fun items in them, and the control group, uh, which were the group of students that watched just regular videos with no fun items inserted in them. To give students incentive and encouragement to view online materials, the course instructors inform students that each video will have an associated multiple choice question on the midterm or final exam based on them. The authors found that on average, students who were randomized to watching videos that were accompanied by songs had higher percent of correct answers, 50% of times on statistical concept assessment, than those who were randomized to watching regular videos with no songs, which resulted in only um, 43% of the times getting uh, the answers correct. In terms of the use of cartoon and other means, the mean percent of correct answers to statistical concept assessments were not statistically significantly different between those who were randomly assigned to watching videos that had cartoons inserted in them and those who watched videos that had no cartoons uh, or other means uh, inserted in them. Overall, there were no statistically significant differences in any of the attitude components measured by SATS instrument. Moreover, there were no uh, statistically significant differences in any of the five subscale of statistical anxiety measured by SAM um, instrument between those who watch videos that had fun items inserted in them and those who watched uh, just the regular videos. So based on the result of their student randomized experiment and the review of the literature, the authors discussed the rationale for why uh, they uh, believe song-based videos of statistical concepts tend to improve students' statistics outcomes more than other fun items such as cartoons. They assert that songs tend to be more memorable and sustain engagement. It takes longer to listen to a song than to glance at a cartoon. And then also the fact that uh, songs are um, pleasurable to, to listen to. The authors describe some possible future ideas for conducting future research studies. They suggest replicating uh, this study with larger number of student population uh, from various institutions. They also suggest that future uh, research should investigate the placements of fun items, songs in the video lessons on students' achievement and attitudes. They point out that it would be helpful to realize the location for placing the fun items in the illustration of statistical lessons to students and assess the effect of these placements at the beginning, during, or at the end on students' learning and students' reduction of uh, their statistical anxiety.
This is Jeremy Strayer, Associate Professor in the Department of Mathematical Sciences at Middle Tennessee State University. Today, I will discuss four chapters from the book, Building Support for Scholarly Practices in Mathematics Methods. The book was edited by Sina Kastberg, Andrew Tominski, Allison Lishka, and Wendy Sanchez. It is important because it helps the field of mathematics teacher education take a step forward with regard to what we do in methods courses to prepare future mathematics teachers. This book addresses the Association of Mathematics Teacher Educators' challenge to ground the work done in methods courses and findings from empirical studies. In response to this challenge, the editors organized a conference that brought together a group of mathematics teacher educators to engage in scholarly conversations focused on three things the learning goals for mathematics methods courses, activities that would support these goals, and the experiences of pre-service teachers as they internalize the highlighted activities. The editors recognized that the field typically frames these kinds of conversations from three different perspectives, namely the socio-political perspective, the cognitive perspective, and the situative perspective. I will briefly discuss these perspectives as presented in the book with regard to methods courses and conclude this discussion by reflecting across the three perspectives. Rochelle Gutierrez writes in Chapter 2 from the sociopolitical perspective. She argues that learning goals, activities, and experiences in methods courses should help pre-service teachers develop what she terms political conocimiento. Political conocimiento is knowledge that is useful for deconstructing society's narratives of deficiency, specifically those narratives that position students, teachers, and public education as somehow lacking in important valued areas. The activities in her chapter describe ways that mathematics teacher educators can help teachers build knowledge that enables them to take a stand as they deconstruct society's narratives of deficiency and then reclaim the profession of mathematics education so that classroom teachers can create learning environments that are truly in the best interest of the students. It should be noted that when this book chapter was published, it was attacked by a politically motivated group. This resulted in many outpourings of support from allies, including the mathematics education scholarly community. Now, from the cognitive perspective, Martin Simon's chapter 3 builds on the widely accepted notion that, quote, students learn by building on prior knowledge. They don't take in new ideas from materials or from somebody else. Students don't perceive mathematical relationships. Rather, they build concepts from their prior knowledge in the context of their experience, unquote. Simon makes the case that the learning goals, activities, and experiences in methods courses should help pre-service teachers come to understand specific pedagogical concepts, namely, pedagogical concepts that will enable pre-service teachers to teach students to build mathematical concepts on their own prior knowledge. Three of these pedagogical concepts include negotiation of classroom norms, what it means to develop arithmetic operations, and understanding the difference between empirical learning and reflective abstraction. In Chapter 4, Elham Kazemi discusses methods courses from the perspective that action, cognition, and learning is always situated. Cognition is understood as the interaction between participants and tools in the context of activities completed in community. So Kazemi contends that inquiry and practice in methods courses should attend to understanding what the situated character of teaching and learning actually is. Kazemi describes learning goals, activities, and experiences in a methods course that fully embraces this situative perspective. Here, pre-service teachers participate in cycles of learning where they first plan, rehearse, and refine lessons in community. Second, visit a K-12 classroom where they co-teach their lesson with the support of teacher educators. And third, debrief the student thinking and instructional decision-making that occurred during the K-12 lesson. Enacting these cycles of learning in a methods course creates an activity system where pre-service teachers are able to legitimately participate as a teacher within the larger teaching community of practice. Chapters 5 through 21 in the book are excellent resources that further discuss inquiry and practice in methods courses. They explore particular learning goals, activities, and experiences that are situated within these three perspectives. In the final chapter, Richard Kitchen provides a commentary with urgency. 
He challenges the mathematics education community to determine the ethical role we must play to put an end to the historic legacy of students of color and low-income students in the U.S. being denied access to a quality education in mathematics. He says now is the time for our community to step up and deal explicitly and collectively with the injustices taking place in schools. To do so, we must understand and help pre-service teachers understand injustice. That, if a teacher treats students differently based on race, class, religion, gender, and or sexual orientation, then that teacher has not loved every one of their students equally. Kitchen argues that we do not need to be scholars in the sociopolitical perspective to make a difference in this regard. Indeed, one of the most powerful things we can do as mathematics teacher educators to address historic inequities in mathematics education is to help pre-service teachers develop meaningful relationships with students. Kitchen makes the case that relationship building cuts across all three perspectives, and he details how relationship building with K-12 students during methods courses is central to many of the activities presented in the book. In my view, this book raises important questions for consideration by the broader mathematics education community. For example, when Kitchen offers the practice of loving students equally as a means of combating injustice, what exactly does loving students equally mean? One definition says that love is, quote, unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another, unquote. It seems to me that this is a good place to start. So, how does one act lovingly while specifically teaching mathematics? What practices should we consider to be loving actions in the context of teaching, or in the broader educational context. In addition, because practices are enacted within particular traditions, it is important to articulate the tradition or array of traditions on which to draw that loving actions will be firmly rooted within. Is the American tradition of e pluribus unum, out of many one, fertile enough soil in which to plant these loving actions? For if a wave of mathematics teachers collectively loves all students equally in an effort specifically to combat injustice, then resistance will surely come. Without a strong and clearly articulated tradition from which to draw, the roots of our actions may be too shallow to survive the winds of resistance. Hi, my name is Marty Fong. I'm a mathematics educator in Northern California, and I'm summarizing Nicole L. Louis's research paper titled The Culture of Exclusion in Mathematics Education and Its Persistence in Equity-Oriented Teaching from the Journal for Research in Mathematics Education. In her study, Louis examined the presence and pervasiveness of what she terms the culture of exclusion. The culture of exclusion refers to the framing of mathematics education in which a teacher models formulaic problems to his or her students, who in turn transcribe and mimic the procedure demonstrated by the teacher. The culture of exclusion is so termed for a few general reasons. One, it excludes sense-making, experimentation, communication, and creativity from what students learn to call mathematical activity. Two, it excludes all students, but especially those who struggle to work quickly and precisely from meaningful engagement with mathematics. And three, it excludes students from developing positive identities as mathematicians while it perpetuates a strictly linear hierarchy of mathematical ability. That is, you're good at math, you're bad at math, or you're somewhere in between, rather than being good at one aspect of math and still growing in another aspect of math. Thus, Louis' central question in her paper is, how does the culture of exclusion affect the classroom instruction of mathematics teachers who explicitly aim to advance equity? Louis conducted her study at a high school, which, in her paper, has the pseudonym Union High, in which more than half of the students were English language learners, and nearly three-quarters of the students were socioeconomically disadvantaged. During the 2012-2013 school year in which Louis performed her study, the entire math department at Union High was participating in professional development for complex instruction or CI, a pedagogical approach that aims to produce inclusive or multidimensional math teaching. That is, 
math teaching that values multiple dimensions of mathematical activity, such as asking good questions, explaining ideas, using logical deduction, justifying answers, using manipulatives, not just replicating rote procedures. Louis focused her study on four geometry teachers at Union High and observed their classes four to eight times throughout the school year. Of these four geometry teachers, one was a second year teacher who was new to CI, one was a second year teacher who was considered an expert with CI, one was a 10th year teacher who was new to CI, and the last was another 10th year teacher who was also considered an expert with CI. So she had every possible cross section between CI expertise and raw teaching experience. Louis found that even though the teachers had committed to empowering students who had not been well served by the previous math education experiences, the culture of exclusion still dominated their classrooms. The teachers still implied mathematical activity as the rote practice of formulas and procedures, and still framed mathematical ability as being linear and hierarchical rather than multidimensional. Even when the teachers made intentional attempts to disrupt the culture of exclusion, there were usually underlying ways in which those attempts actually reinforced the dominant culture of exclusion. To give an example, at one point throughout the school year, the teachers attempted to differentiate their assignments using tasks that they called menus. These menus began with simple practice problems called appetizers, which all students were expected to complete, after which the students could move on to more complex problems. In theory, the menus would allow each student to work on math that was at an appropriate difficulty level for him or her and to feel successful with mathematics, a noble attempt at equity. But in practice, the vast majority of students spent entire class periods only on the appetizer problems. It was assumed and communicated by the structure of these menus that some students are capable of accessing higher level, richer math content, but most students are not, perpetuating the linear, hierarchical frame of mathematical ability. If you got to the dessert problems, you must be good at math. If you didn't, you're not so good at math. However, there was one teacher among Louis's Focal Four who had relative success with disrupting the culture of exclusion. This was a second year teacher who was considered an expert in CI, referred to in the paper as Ryan. Louis recorded that when Ryan helped his students during class, he worked with the whole group at a time and asked questions in a responsive way that drew helpful knowledge from each group member and allowed the group collectively to solve a problem. In this way, Ryan positioned each group member within the classroom culture as an equally valuable resource for the other members. In her quantitative data, Louis determined that 48% of the episodes, or segments, that she observed in Ryan's class reinforced inclusive or multidimensional framing, compared to 7%, 10%, and 16% for the other three focal teachers. Louis attributes Ryan's success to his participation with multiple outside teacher communities, both formally and informally throughout the school year, that sustained his engagement with multidimensional frames by providing him with resources, a sense of solidarity, and affirmation. For a number of reasons, including scheduling conflicts and other demands on their time and energy, the other three focal teachers did not participate in these outside teacher communities. Thus, in the final section of her paper, Louis asserts that in order to progress in disrupting the culture of exclusion in mathematics education, more should be done to immerse teachers in communities with other teachers who have been successful at normalizing multidimensional framing, and suggests even restructuring the school day to accomplish this so that teachers could participate in these communities during normal work hours rather than needing to volunteer their weekends and evenings in order to become better multidimensional teachers. You've just heard a summary provided by Marty Fong of Nicole Louie's recent JRME publication, The Culture of Exclusion in Mathematics Education and Its Persistence in Equity-Oriented Teaching. We are lucky to now be joined by the author herself to get her reaction and ask a few follow-up questions. Dr. Nicole Louie, welcome to the Math Ed podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So we just heard a summary of your article. Is there anything you would like to add or clarify? Yeah, so I think the big thing I want to talk about is culture and why I view the culture of exclusion as a culture at all. So the first piece is that I see it as more than a collection of exclusionary or restrictive practices. 
It's a way of thinking about A, what it means to do mathematics, and B, who is mathematically competent or able. So the paper is less about labeling specific instructional strategies good or bad than it is about examining the webs of meaning that these strategies reinforce or potentially tear. A second point is that the culture of exclusion in mathematics education is intimately connected to a much broader culture of exclusion in modern society and how we think about intelligence and worth. So in his summary, Marty highlighted the linear hierarchy of mathematical ability. This hierarchy is mapped onto other social categories, such as gender, English proficiency, and race, as Danny Martin and others have described in their scholarship, and I think is evident in some of the classroom episodes in this paper. Our culture assigns different value to people based on these categories, and the culture of exclusion in mathematics education isn't in isolation from that broader culture. It both reflects those ideologies and contributes to their reproduction as a tool for naturalizing and legitimating hierarchies. So a couple of follow-up questions to that. First, focusing on teachers' talk, you coded episodes of classroom transcript as exclusionary, inclusive, or mixed. As Marty noted in his summary, Ryan was your most inclusively framing teacher, but even then, more than half the episodes coded for him were exclusionary or mixed. And this was a teacher who you said completed student teaching at Railside, and he had developed quite a network of professional resources that reinforced inclusive practices. So as I concluded your article, it didn't exactly leave me feeling optimistic. Well, the purpose of the article isn't necessarily to create optimism. I think one of the major things that struck me in doing this work was the persistence of the culture of exclusion. Initially, I had planned to investigate how this wonderful department built a community that really supported teachers to make sense of and enact equitable mathematics instruction. And what became very clear was that this culture of exclusion is the dominant culture of mathematics education. Its underlying logic has this non-trivial presence for all of the teachers. And I don't think this is something that we can reduce to just teachers as individuals. And I think a lot of the ways that we talk about solving this problem through professional development, uh, through teacher education, miss the fact that this is a cultural problem that we all participate in to some degree. It's not an issue of somebody's bad teaching. It's about a, a logic and a way of understanding what mathematics education is about. So that connects to my second question, which you may have just answered, and that is that I saw this as a paper that was about a study of teaching, but then in the end seemed to imply that when it comes to reducing the prevalence of the culture of exclusion, teaching or instructional practices might not necessarily be where we need to be focusing our efforts. I think it is and it isn't. So on the one hand, teaching is the site for education to be realized for students. And for me, as much as I think that respecting teachers and creating um, amazing, respectful learning opportunities for them is really important, where the rubber meets the road, uh, the bottom line is the experience that we're able to create for students in classrooms. So teaching is critical there. But I think as far as where we need to be thinking about change, I think it's much bigger than questions about uh, specific instructional practices for teaching mathematics. To me, it's really about values and relationships at every level of the education system. So one thing that makes me optimistic is the time I've been spending with teachers on the south side of Chicago who understand their work as teaching children through mathematics, not teaching mathematics to or at children. And the ethics of care and respect that they bring to their work, I think, makes it much more possible for mathematics to be a vehicle for inclusion and humanization. Another piece is that I think we do need to put a lot of emphasis on the kinds of learning opportunities that we're creating for teachers and the sorts of resources that we're making available to them as alternatives to the resources that the dominant culture provides. So one of the implications of this research, I think, is that we need to think more broadly about the alternative resources that teachers may need to counter that culture. And that's the focus of an article that I published in Teachers College Record earlier this year. And to a lesser extent, it's also part of a piece I wrote that just came out in Educational Studies in Mathematics. Thank you for sharing your additional insights about this paper and about Marty's summary. I appreciate you taking the time. It was really nice chatting with you. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much, Chuck.